Thank you very much, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me. And like Paul Zenon, who was on earlier on, my apologies for not speaking in Bulgarian. So uh, today I'm going to be explaining to you about how the sense of smell works, and it will involve some audience participation. So I'll be asking you to help at a number of points. So if you would like to, when I ask, please come up and volunteer. So there are lots of different kinds of noses in the animal kingdom. Uh, every one of those structures you can see there is a nose. I'm sure none of you will be able to identify all of them. The one on the very top right, that's a star-nosed mole. Uh, it's a mole that lives in the ground and its noses are absolutely bizarre. The rest of them are various uh, mammals, fish and insects. But the point is the sense of smell is incredibly old. In fact, it's the oldest of the senses. The very first organisms that will have lived about 3.8 billion years ago, the first sense that they had, the first way they had of understanding the outside world would have been the chemical senses. Would have, they would have had to try and move through chemical gradients. And this is the oldest sense that we have. So why would you want to smell? What reasons are there in evolution that have driven the development of this incredibly complex sense? You might want to eat to be able to find food. You might want to find a mate, be able to detect another partner. If you look at these two flies, the fly at the top has very, very long antennae. This is almost certainly the male, and he is using his antennae to detect the smells produced by the female. You might want to know where your home is. If you're a bee, your, your hive has a particular smell, and you can identify with your sisters, with the other bees, by the smell that you all have. You probably use smell for memory. Now, when I was a boy, I would go to the swimming baths, and there would be the smell of the chlorine and the water. And afterwards, I would have a very unhealthy snack. I would have a packet of crisps and this drink called Vimto, which is from the north of England and is very, very sweet. Uh, it's very bad for your teeth. But this mixture of smells brings back, if I drink Vimto today, it brings back the memory of going to the swimming baths. And in all organisms that have a brain and can remember things, one of the first things that the brain does with signals coming from its smell cells is to send them to the place where your memory is encoded. So smell is incredibly powerful in releasing not just, oh, I remember a particular thing, a fact, but a whole experience. I'm sure you've all had, uh, you, you know this, the smell of violets may rem remind you of your grandmother or something like that. It brings back the whole experience. Smell can also be used by animals to mark their territory, to identify a particular place that they are uh, in charge of, or it may be a way of being able to identify danger, the smell of a predator. Or there are other dangers. Most organisms, most terrestrial organisms, will respond to the smell of fire, for example, which is extremely important as a phenomenon in the natural world. Long before humans, there were, desert fi there were, there were fires like this that would sweep through whole areas of woodland, and animals would have to move away from it. So we can all smell the smell of smoke. But probably the most surprising thing to you is that you use your sense of smell to be able to taste. That probably seems a rather strange idea, but in fact, you taste with your nose. And we're going to show this now. Now, everybody in the aisle has magically, if you look under your seat, if could everybody in each of the aisles look under the, front, the first seat, you'll, don't start eating them yet. You'll find in there a jelly bean. Everybody right to the back. The front seat has got a jelly bean. Take a jelly bean. Don't eat. Don't look at it. We're going to do a little experiment. Take a jelly bean and hand on the cup down the row. Everybody, quickly, do it quickly. Hurry up. Takes too, don't take too long. Take, don't eat it. Don't look at it. Just hold it in your hand. Okay? Every row's got a set of jelly beans. Pretty much. What we're going to do... In a minute, when I tell you, 
is you're going to hold your nose and you are going to put the jelly bean into your mouth. You will then chew, and then when I say, you will take your fingers off your nose, okay? And you will see a difference. So what I want you to try and do first is to identify the, the flavor that you are chewing. Okay, has everybody got a jelly bean? Yes, yes. over there, you all got a jelly bean. Right, everybody do it. We take our jelly bean, put it into them. Just taste sweet, take your fingers off the nose and, whoa, that work? You, you can smell, you can taste now what your jelly bean actually tasted of. Does it work? No, yes, no, okay. All right, it works sometimes. Now, why does it do that? Because effectively, your smell cells are in the roof of your, uh, in your nose, but they're not here. They're right at eye level. They're dangling down through a hole in your brain, a hole in the bottom of your skull. Okay, so these cells uh, that are dangling down, and as you chew, in fact, air goes up from the back of your mouth into your nasal cavity and stimulates these cells and produces part of the experience of eating. And that's why taste and smell are so completely intermingled. We had a lady uh, who came up to me during the break who has no sense of smell. She's never had a sense of smell. And that has an effect for people who've lost their sense of smell or have been born without it. Then their sensory experience is different from the rest of us. So here's a, a little picture that you can see these cells that are down here. My pointer doesn't work on this uh, projector. So they're coming down through your brain, through your skull, the bottom of your skull, into the outside world. So really, these cells, which are in fact part of your brain, show that not only do you taste with your nose, but you smell with your brain. So one of the things that people generally think is that humans have a very poor set of uh, a poor sense of smell. If we compare it to a dog, most people think dogs have got a very good sense of smell and humans have a very poor sense of smell. This is not, in fact, the case. You can detect about the same range of smells as a dog. The difference is that your, your, your threshold of response is much higher. So a dog can detect minute quantities of a smell and it requires a human much more before they can actually detect that smell. But to demonstrate quite how sensitive our noses are, I'm going to ask for four volunteers to come up, and I'm going to prove to you that you have an atomic nose. So can I have four volunteers, please, to come up? First four people, just come up, come up, four people. Four people. First four, first four, one, thank you. Two, three, and a lady, please. We've got four gentlemen, can I have a lady? Here's a lady coming up. Excellent, thank you. We have five. Yes, you can come as well. Come on, we can have five. Come on. <laughs> Give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. The stairs are here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just give uh, some quite ordinary smells first, and you can answer in Bulgarian. You don't have to answer in English. I don't mind. Um, so what we're going to do is just detect these... Um, oops, no, this is complicated. Um, can you can do this. That'd be help. That'd be great help. Okay, so... Oops. I can smell it. Oof. Now, you might know, shut your eyes is going to be easiest. Just smell this. Don't answer. Say what you think. It, just see if you can imagine it. Mm. <laughs> These are all quite... Not, you all know. You may not be able to give a name to it, but when I, <laughs> when I say what it is, or when I show... Okay. Right. Can you do ask them, What did you think it was? In Bulgarian. Mm. Lavender. Lavender. Mm? Lavender. Lavender. Nick with the initial alcohol, no much. Something alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same, same also here, something alcoholic. Lemon. Yay, very good. Lemon. Okay, so lemon. <laughs> so, the ladies were better, right. Okay, now see if you can, uh, see if you can get this one. Mm-hmm, yeah. It's not alcohol. <laughs> oh, dear, she didn't like that. Sorry. 
Окей? Нямам представа. No idea. И аз нещо сладичко. Банан. Ей, very good. Банан. Банана. Окей, very good, right. Okay, we've got a few more to go. And now this one. Now this is a bit different. But see if you can... <laughs> you have a very sensitive nose. Most people like the smell. Any ideas? Something to eat, he says. Ah, it's very good. It smells of feet. <laughs> Bread or peanuts. Oh. Those two don't smell the same. <laughs> I'm not really sure. Something moldy. Moldy. Popcorn. Popcorn. But it's toast. Toast. Okay, right, one more, and then we'll do the atomic thing. So here's another smell. So this is not a food stuff. You can't eat this, okay? So the audience knows what it is. You can't eat this. It's very important. <laughs> so it's a thing rather than a food. I Iodine. Аз саквам те, че не знам още. No idea. Гума. Рубър. Сой сос. Сой сос. Сейм. Това е смок. Смок. Ааа. Окей, now finally, I'm going to show that they have atomic noses. And I'm going to just give them two smells which you have never smelt. These are chemicals, so they are pure. Uh, you would never smell them like this. They don't smell very nice. I will just give you a little smell. I want to say you to say if you can tell the difference. That's all I'm interested in. Can you smell the difference between this? Okay, and this. No? Not really. Not really. Okay. This. And this. It's a very subtle difference. Yes, yes hooray. <laughs> Not alcohol. Well, it is. <laughs> this and that. You smell a difference? Yeah. yeah. You've got a very sensitive nose. I don't want to hurt you. Yeah, that. And this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Def definitely. Okay. That and that. Okay. So they could have... Well done. Everybody can tell the difference. Now, you, you can go and sit down. That's fine. Thank you. What I'll explain... That was the first smell, and that was the second smell. Now, that doesn't mean anything, and the reason is that that is the number of carbons that there were in those two smells. So the first smell was an alcohol. The gentleman was absolutely right. They were both alcohols, but you shouldn't drink them. The first one has got seven carbons and is called heptanol, and people say it smells violet, sweet, woody. The second smell had eight carbons, so just one carbon atom more, and people say it smells sweet, orange, rose. So there's kind of an overlap, but they're different. And most people could smell that there was something different. And what they were picking up was a single atom of carbon. The only difference between those two molecules is one atom of carbon on the end. So when people say we don't have a very sensitive sense of smell, we can detect the difference between a single atom of carbon in two compounds. So that's quite an amazing feat. The question then arises, how does it work? And our understanding of how the sense of smell works, as in most bits of science, in fact, goes back to the ancient Greeks. So the first person to come up with the idea to think about this seriously was Democritus, or Democrates, if you prefer the Greek uh, title. So Democrates was the first atomist. So he sat in Greece, looking out over the Aegean, just thinking. He didn't do any experiments, he just thought. And what he came up with was the idea that all matter, everything, is made of atoms. And this was 
just on the basis of thinking about it. Quite remarkable insight. And he not only thought about, well, what are tables made of, and humans, and trees. He also thought about sensory experience. And what he decided was that if something smelled nice, then the atom must be kind of round. And if something smells horrible, the atom must be kind of pointy and stick in your nose and horrible. And to be honest, that's still where we are. There is some relationship <laughs> between the shape of a molecule and what it smells like, but we don't know what that relationship is. We can't understand it yet. The big breakthrough came a long time after Democrates, where these two people, Linda Buck and Richard Axel, in 1991, so 22 years ago, they identified the molecules that do the receiving of the smells, the molecules in our noses. And they won the Nobel Prize for this in 2004. So if we go back to our diagram of the brain, what they identified were the molecules right on the outside of these cells, on their first surface, that are a bit like a lock. If you imagine that a smell is like a key, and you have a lock which is on your cell, and the smell comes in and activates that receptor, as it's called. Now, that's the basic idea about how the sense of smell works, but you'll have noticed that it's rather vague. So we want to know, how does, is that it? Is that, how does it really, really work? And the answer is very simple. We don't know. <laughs> and those are the best answers in science, because the question then becomes, how can we find out? Because science is not just about knowing lots of stuff. It's great fun knowing stuff. But the really exciting thing about science is finding out stuff we don't know. So the first thing you need to do is to find a question that we don't know the answer to. So how does the sense of smell work is the thing that I'm really interested in. Now, there's lots of ways of trying to study that. This is one way that people do. <laughs> and I don't particularly fancy doing that. So I've chosen a different way of trying to understand how the sense of smell works. And I use this. Now, these are maggots. Maggots are baby flies. What's the Bulgarian word? No, not larvae. What's the, what's the word that ordinary people use? Not larvae, but... Yeah, okay, those words. I, could, I use the same word in English. In English, it's maggot, which is a very old word. It's not the Latin scientific word, which is larvae. I call them maggots, because that's what ordinary people call them. So these maggots, when you look at them very, very close up, this is what it looks like. And the things marked D are its noses. They're not its eyes, they're its noses. Now, I study these maggots. And there's a very simple reason why I study them. You and I have four million smell cells, and they're grouped into about 400 different types. My maggot has just 21, and each of those cells is different. So, from a point of view of simplicity, it's a very, very simple model, much simpler than a human being. What's amazing is that despite all the, the differences and the fact that we've been separated from flies for about 600 million years, the way our brains are wired up to detect smell is essentially the same. So any animal has basically the same structure in its brain for detecting different smells. So we can use the maggot as a model for trying to understand smell in general, including in us. So I'm going to take you now to a journey to the center of the nose. So what we're going to do is zoom in on those two things, those round blobs marked D. When you get very, very close, you can see it's a dome. And if you get really, really close, you can see that the dome has got lots of pores, small slits in it, and that, we think, is how the smell actually gets into the nose. And this dome, this round structure, if you cut it through, is in fact composed of these 21 smell cells that branch and mingle at the top. You can see there are 21, I'm going to have to get down, I'm going to have to point at this. So there are these, they're in seven bundles of three cells all around the dome, and they branch up and form this dome-like structure. 
Now, these are not just any maggots. They're not maggots you go fishing with. They're geneticist maggots. So some of you who may have studied this fly, Drosophila melanogaster. So this is the fly that was used when basically we discovered the laws of genetics. Morgan and his students discovered genetics in the, ninth, in the early years of the 20th century using this uh, particular fly. And we have sequenced its genome. You will see later on we can do the most amazing things with this fly because we have a lot of tools and people have been studying it for 100 years. The problem is, it's not as big as that. It's as big as this. That's a USB key. So if you've never seen one of these flies, they are really, really, really small. They're the kind that you get hovering around your beer or your wine in the summer. Very, very tiny. So there's a big disadvantage to using flies because they're so small. But we can get over that. But as I said, in fact, I don't study the adult form. I study the maggot. And that's basically all that maggots do. They just wriggle along like that. And they are extremely stupid. They're very simple. They're very hungry. So if you're interested in the sense of smell or in taste, then they provide a very useful model because they can always do exactly, more or less, what you want. They move like that. And if you do complicated analyses of how they move, this is basically all they do. They just wriggle forward, they turn their heads, and very occasionally, they'll rear up. But basically, they move in two dimensions, and they move towards smells. Now, I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going to be talking about some research that I've been doing that I haven't published yet, so some of the latest findings from my uh, laboratory. But first, I want to show you that, although uh, this is a very high-tech work, it's very recent work. In fact, the story of understanding how maggots smell goes way, way back. The first drawing that I was able to find of the maggot's nose is this drawing. And the, the maggots do actually, these are maggots you find in cheese. Maybe you get them in Bulgaria. You get them a lot in Italy. It, some Italians think that cheese with maggots in is very nice. It isn't. It's very nasty. It's disgusting. But they like eating it. And the maggots hold on to their they put their tail in the mouth, and then they will let go, and they can jump. They can jump about 30 centimeters. And this man, Jean Schwammerdam, who was a Dutchman, in the 17th century, he did this amazing drawing of one of these jumping maggots. And he did it with a tiny, tiny microscope, not the kind of microscope you imagine, a microscope made of a ball of glass one millimeter across. And this was, uh, you can see the top one is a drawing from, that he made, and then I reconstructed exactly what this microscope, which has been lost to us, but what the microscope must have looked like. So a tiny ball of glass, he would hold it up to his eye and be able to see through it. And you can see here, right at the end, at the very end, where those hooks are, you can see a little dome structure exactly like the nose that I showed you earlier on in my electron micrograph. He even, Schwammerdam, even dissected the brain. Now, I could not do a dissection as good as this. The structure in the middle, I'm going to come down again. This structure here is the brain. These two things marked B are the olfactory nerves. They're the nerves going to the D, which is the domes that I showed you in my diagram. So Schwammerdam was able to do a dissection of a maggot brain, even though he didn't really know what he was looking for. End of history lesson. If you want to know more, I've written a very interesting book about this, uh, which is available from booksellers. And there are a couple of websites associated with that. As I mentioned, this is a uh, Drosophila uh, maggot, so we can do all sorts of strange things with it. One of the things we can do is make a maggot with just one functioning smell cell in its nose. In the picture on the right, we're expressing what's called green fluorescent protein, which is from a jellyfish. So we've got something from a jellyfish, and we've put it in a maggot, and it glows green. And you can see all 21 of the cells are glowing green. In the picture on the, your right, you can see that there's just one cell that works. So we can make a maggot with just one cell in its, its nose, and then we can ask it, what can you smell? 
we can record, I'll be showing you some recordings from the activity of that tiny, tiny nerve. Remember how small the, the fly is? A maggot's about the same size as that. So these are absolutely minuscule neurons that we can record from. And this is how we do it. It's very high tech. We've got a matchstick. So there's a matchstick here. I'm going to go down. This is a matchstick. We strap the maggot to it. You can see these little black dots in the yellow oval. Those black things are its mouth hooks. And we've got an electrode here, which is going into its back. And we've got an electrode here, which is going right delicately into the dome to be able to record from the nose. And we then blow a smell over it, and we get a particular response. And here's some examples, and it shows that the, the nose is not a computer. What you can see here, this is real data. The green pictures show exactly what the cells are doing. We've got two different cells. One's called, doesn't matter what they're called, what they're 24A and 74A. And we've given them three different smells. Octanol, which we were smelling up here. It's one with eight carbons. And then two other compounds. And basically, you can see that that each time, in each combination of a smell and a neuron, it's doing something different. It's not just an on-off response. It's not a switch. You are getting, sometimes the signal stops. If you look at the, the signal for octanol, the cell is firing a lot without any smell. Then you get the smell coming, which is the gray bar or the little bar above the green uh, trace, and the signal stops. So you can get a cell turning off that's telling the brain information. Each of the shapes of those curves in the, in the, where we've added them all together, each of the shapes is different. So what this shows us is that it's not a binary one or zero response. The nose is giving lots and lots of information to the brain. And this fits with our understanding of how the sense of smell works. Because what we know... This is just a, a figure. It's all, all the data here is made up, but it gives you an idea. What we've got here are different smells, and two of them happen to be the seven and eight we were just smelling. And at the top, we've got the different kinds of receptor. And so each odor is, being, is stimulating more than one kind of receptor, and each receptor can detect more than one kind of odor. So... Even if we just think of the, the olfactory system, the smell system, as being composed of activating or not activating, as being zeros and ones, you've got an amazingly rich system of coding taking place in your nose. Before it gets anywhere near the brain, your nose is already classifying all the smells it can come up with. If you add on to that, that there may be, it's not just on or off, but there's also these other dimensions, the overall shape of the curve, being able to actually stop firing, not change your activity. In fact, the code in your nose is incredibly rich. As I indicated earlier on, the, the, the big problem in this is we don't know why a particular smell activates a particular receptor. The, that remains a very, very big mystery, and we don't have any answers. So this is telling us that the, the smell... Your, your very first classifying of smells is incredibly rich. The number of potential smells you could classify is with our, uh, our 4 million smell cells, our 400 types, is probably infinite, the number of smells we could potentially detect. And there's a reason why we need such a rich system, because the smell world is indeed virtually infinite. We don't know how many smells there are in the world. We know how many wavelengths of light there are, of visible light, we don't know how many smells there are. There are conceivably millions and millions and millions of different odors that we could detect. Just to give you one example, if you smell a rose, it smells nice, smells of rose, but if you extract all the volatile molecules that are coming off that rose, there are over 200 and different, 250 different molecules. So the sensory world is far, far richer than we imagine. And our ability to respond to that, to detect that richness, is very, very strong. So what I'm going to do now is show you some uh, data. And I'm going to show you some work from my laboratory on maggots. And one of the things we do is to watch them behave. 
So what we've got here is a group of maggots in the middle. On the far side, there is a smell. And on this side, there is not a smell. And I put the maggots in the middle, and then I basically uh, let them get on with it. And you can see, this is speeded up. You can see here that they're going in all, initially, they're all going every which way. But very soon, they tend to move towards where the smell is. So I'm just showing you this. It's not as interesting as the monkeys we saw earlier on, I'm afraid. Uh, but these are just maggots. And that's why they're interesting, because they're stupid. So <laughs> it's very important, very important, because they don't do anything else. They are concentrating on the task at hand, trying to get big and fat and turn into a fly. So at the end of five minutes, you can count the number of maggots on one side and the number of maggots on the other side and make a nice little index. And we use this kind of experiment to come up with something that's a bit surprising. So here we've got the activity, the electrical activity, in just one kind of cell. I think it's 59A. And we gave them all those different smells that you can see in color along the bottom of the graph. And we've got just three smells are exciting this particular cell. And they're all, two of them are doing it fairly strongly. Yeah, the two on the, on, your le on, on the left of the picture of doing it fairly strongly. So you might imagine that if we then take those maggots and instead of uh, putting an electrode in their nose, we give them the smell in that little dish that I've just shown you, that we would get two or maybe three very strong peaks of response where they, they really can detect the smell and so they should be showing a behavior. But in fact, we just get one peak here. See the, oops, oops sorry, oops, let's go back. We just get one peak. And the other two peaks of electrophysiological activity of firing don't produce any behavior. So the maggot smelling that signal is going, yeah, OK, there's something there. I don't know what it means. So it just ignores it. So this shows us two things. Firstly, that, of course, you have to have activity in a cell for the brain to be able to decide to respond, but that's not sufficient because we've got these two peaks on the right of the curve where we've got strong activity but no behavior. So this is telling us something about the uh, peripheral code. Now, what exactly does the brain, does the nose tell the brain? I indicated earlier on that it's not binary, on or off. We can look at this. We've got the gray bar, the vertical gray bar, is when the smell's being delivered. So you get a nice peak of activity, but then at, when we turn it off, we get another peak of activity, and you can see that in the, in the green uh, line. So this is telling us that the brain is seeing lots of things. It's saying, first, there's a change, because each cell is normally just firing every few seconds just spontaneously. And a response is a change from spontaneous activity. It might go up. It might even get turned off. So you get a change. That can be more activity or less activity. And you also are getting a change over time. So you're not just getting a square on, off. You're getting this temporal change. So what this means is that these two things I've just shown you means that it's not we can't reduce our perception of smells to the activity of just one or two or three cells. It's the whole of our cells. It's the cells that aren't responding that are just saying, no, there's nothing there, as alongside the cell that is saying, oh, oh, I can smell something. That together is what produces our impression of a smell. So the image of a smell involves the activity of all the smell cells, not just of one or two. And there will be a set of a kind of template, an image that the brain is expecting that means that, in the case of our maggots, we could get a very strong activity but no behavior because that overall signal of 21 channels with just one cell saying, I can smell something, and the other 20 not responding, doesn't mean anything to the maggot. It has no meaning in its evolutionary past. Now, one thing that I've made some emphasis about is the fact that there seems to be this temporal, this time-based structure. It's not just on or off, but there's something going on over time. And that looks quite convincing. But how can we actually prove that that's the case? 
Now, as I said, these are Drosophila flies. We can manipulate them, and we can do something very strange, which sounds quite surreal. We can make a maggot smell blue. Now, I indicated earlier on I'd taken a jellyfish gene and put it into the fly so we could get this green glowing stuff. What we can do now is we are going to get a molecule that detects light and put that in the nose. So really, what we've done is we've turned its nose, a smell cell, into an eye. That smell cell will still respond to smells, but we can now activate it with light. So by shining a blue light, the smell cell then responds. So we can then have a different sequence. We can flash the light in very quick successions and make the smell cell respond as though it was smelling a particular smell. Okay? So changing the cell's activity by sequences of light. When I showed this to my daughter, who's 17, she said, Daddy, you have mind control over that maggot. And it's true, you do. I control its mind. Okay? Um, so initially, the maggot is just mooching around. It, it, it's just trying to find something interesting to smell. And you can see from the past traces, from the previous 30 seconds, it's not doing anything. Now we flash the blue light in a particular sequence, and it, there's something there. It's, it's not, it, this, there was a smell, it's gone. Where did it come from? And the maggot is now moving in a direction. So we've gone from very random behavior to now the maggot is responding. And that tells us, therefore, that the sequence of electrical activity we put into its brain by flashing the light means something to the maggot. And we were able to come up with something quite remarkable. So, if you, you can't quite see this, I don't think. What we've got here are two examples of what the maggot neuron does, the cell does, when we stimulate it with blue light. On the, we've got two brief pulses of light of 200 milliseconds, which are separated by a gap of 200 milliseconds in the one on the left, and by 300 milliseconds in the one on the right. You might just be able to make out the, uh, the forms at the top. We then gave maggots a whole set of differing gaps between two very brief flashes, and saw how they behaved. And what we find, what we've got in this graph is, Above the line is just random behavior. Below the line is that movement where they're trying to find somewhere, find where they're going. And basically what we found, we gave differing intervals, two pulses with longer and longer intervals. This is in milliseconds at the bottom, so it's really brief. You'd barely be able to notice it. But then not only can the neuron notice it, but the maggot's brain interprets it. Because after 300 milliseconds, if a gap of 300 milliseconds between two pulses, that means something to the maggot. They always, after that point, show this directional behavior. The little stars mean that it's statistically significant, so we can trust those results. So anything, what this is telling us is that changes, it's proving that changes in smell cell activity and the activity profile over time are actually important. They're part of this peripheral activity of what your nose is doing. Your nose isn't just identifying smells, but it's sending very, very complex signals up into your brain. As I say, those data, I haven't even presented them at a scientific conference yet. This is only the second time I've presented them. We've just been getting them in my uh, laboratory. So to summarize, our smell cells respond by a change in activity, which can be very, very complicated, but above all, by a shape. Each smell-cell combination is different, has it induces a different shaped response, and that's the richness of the olfactory code, of the way that we encode smells. Okay, now, I'm just going to stop doing maggots now, because I'm going to go on to something even more amazing, which is another e organism uh, that I work on. But I'm going to need some humans, and I need quite a lot of you. Um, so what I'm going to ask for is, for say, the first three rows, please, just stand up and come around here, and I'm going to give you all a smell. Um, okay, and what we're going to be smelling is this, which you can buy in sex shops. It attracts men, <laughs> allegedly, and it attracts women. Just come, on, come down here. Come, now, you need to stand in line. No, no, stand here. Stand in line. Stand in line. I want the camera to... Can you, can you get out of the way of the camera? Okay, and then you just smell it and go and... 
Okay, that's just fine. Can we see them all? Okay, can we see anybody? Okay, right. No? Oh, he liked it, yeah? No? No? Anybody? No? If you don't like it, say so, no? Didn't care? Off you go. No? No? Yeah, he liked it. No? <laughs> can you sp yeah, okay, he didn't like it, right. No, you can't smell it at all. No? You don't like it, or you, you don't like it? It's horrible. Okay, that's good. No. No, it can't smell it? Okay, so we're getting few people who like it. For me, it smells quite sweet. Do you not like it? I don't like it. You don't like it? Okay. This shows you why you shouldn't buy things in sex shops, because they don't actually work. I like it. You like it? Okay, somebody's honest. He likes it. Okay. Can you smell it? You can't smell it? You can't smell it. You can't smell it. And I'll explain why you can't smell it. You can't really smell it. You can't really... Oh, like you don't like it. Okay, so we're getting a nice range. Oh, she really hates it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. You can sit down now. And I explain it all. <laughs> You're welcome to come up to me afterwards and to uh, find out whether you can smell it. Now, so what, what's interesting is we got there people who, like myself, who it smells quite sweet to, a few people who th seem to think, hmm, that's really rather nice. Some, a lot of people who can't smell it at all, and then a few people who were absolutely revolted by it and thought it was very horrible. So we've got a big range of responses. Now, just to let you know what it really is, I could have predicted, uh, well, I knew that we would get that range of response. If we'd had another animal in here, she would have liked it a lot, because it is, in fact, a pheromone used for inducing uh, mating in pigs. <laughs> so that's why you don't buy it from sex shops. So it's really for pigs. Now, I said earlier on that we didn't know why a particular smell activated a particular receptor. And that's still true, but for this smell in humans, quite remarkably, this was the first time that we were able to identify exactly why or which particular parts of the smell cell were changed, inducing that wide range of response. It's a bit complicated. So what we've got here is the receptor. This is the structure of the receptor that we were all just using to smell the smell. And it's got seven wiggly bits in and out of the membrane. So above the yellow bar is outside of your smell cell, and below is inside. And there are two mutations in humans. One involves a change, it doesn't matter what they are, if you want to know, they're up there, from R to W on the outside, and another involves a change from T to M on the inside. And depending on what combination of these single changes in the genetic code producing differences in proteins, they then produce a different in perception. So we all have two copies of this particular gene which is able to detect the receptor that that gene encodes is able to detect this smell. And if you have either RT or WM, RT and WM, so you've got an R and a T or a W and M, or two copies of W and M, then generally you don't mind it. If you really didn't like it, then you almost certainly have two copies of the RT, RT gene. So, this is a very simple genetic basis for a wide range of perception, whereby some people find it repulsive, some people find it sweet or pleasant, others can't detect it at all. Now, what I've been doing with a colleague is to ask, well, what about um, other populations? Because we know that 70% of New Yorkers really don't like it. As the study was done, they had about 400 people in. New York is an incredibly mixed population. Together with my colleague Cara Hoover in, uh, in Alaska, we've been looking at indigenous peoples. So these are peoples who are not mixed with uh, people from Europe or America or wherever. And we find very different proportions. So the RTRT people, the people who really hate it. And that's most Africans. And of course, we're all Africans originally. Yeah, we all come from Africa. So that, we can assume, is what humans were originally like. Originally, most of us really didn't like the smell of uh, that androsterone. But in some parts of the world, like in the Pacific, quite a lot, most people seem to like it, of these indigenous people. So this is giving us an image of 
how our sense of smell changed as we spread over the planet. And it's possible that differences in how you respond to these smells, which are very important clearly in pigs, and uh, if, you have, if, you eat male, if you eat a male pig, he will often not taste very nice because he will smell of this androsterone, which he is producing in order to excite the female. Um, it may be that we can actually understand certain food choices and changes in agriculture on the basis of how we perceive things and these changes in our genetic makeup as we spread over the planet. But what's amazing, I mean, that's, I think that's quite interesting, but what's really amazing now is we can do something quite astonishing, which 10 years ago would have seemed like science fiction. And I've done this, and I'll show you how you can do it yourselves. We can ask an amazing question. Could our cousins, our ancestors, our cousins, the Neanderthals, could they smell that smell? You can go and type in ORD74, because we have share most of our genes, virtually all our genes, with the Neanderthals, and you find something like this, which when you know how to use it, you can understand that, in fact, the three Neanderthals that we have genetic data for, which is a very small sample size, those three individuals, they all were RTRT. So they could smell this substance, and one would presume would have perceived it in the same way as we did and found it foul and unpleasant. So we can actually look back in time and using the power of genetics and also the availability of this sequence data actually get a perception of what our distant cousins, peoples that we've been separated from for about 800,000 years, but we lived side by side in Europe in, in Bulgaria, I would guess, too, we lived side by side with these peoples. We can get an idea of how we and they perceive the world by using the genetics. So what I've done here is I've gone from maggots to Neanderthals. I've tried to show you the different ways that we can try and understand how the sense of smell works. The key thing I want you to take away is we don't really know. And that really is the most important, those most important words in science. We don't know because that spurs new discovery and new knowledge. What I've shown you is that the way that the smell, the, the smell is detected changes as it, it's not just an on-off signal, it changes during the time in which the cell is responding. So the, 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 the way that those cells are responding is very, very complicated and provides a great deal of data to the brain. From, we've just seen from the Neanderthals, there are amazing possibilities now for desktop citizen science. Anybody can go and explore these databases and try and see similarities and differences with known genes that we know the functions for in humans. We can then go and look for them uh, in our close cousins. And above all, what that, all this shows is that it's what we don't know that is really exciting and what really counts in science. Because... Knowing about stuff, as I said earlier on, is fantastic. We can all learn about that, and I love knowing things. But what I really excites me is not knowing things and trying to work out how I can find the answer. Thank you.